Hello everyone and welcome to this series on the Deep Blue Kasparov matches of 1996 and 1997. Well, we finished with the 1996 match, which Gary won 4-2, uh, though not without losing the first game against Deep Blue. So now we move on to the 1997 match. Um, a really exciting, really iconic match. And um, yeah, I, I think loads and loads of stuff to discover. Um, what's really nice as well is that um, um, I've managed to get hold of the um, uh, the logs of Deep Blue from that uh, from that match. So that also gives us a lot of insight into what uh, Deep Blue was analysing as well. And um, there was um, um, a series of articles actually around 2015-16 by uh, Albert Silver on Chessbase, who um, took a look at the logs, but I think this is the uh, probably the most detailed look at them so far. Um, and uh, yeah, masses of contemporary sources, and of course, um, uh, lots and lots of uh, modern engine analysis, which is also very revealing. Um, so yeah, I mean, the first game, that was Gary Kasparov White against Deep Blue as uh, Black. Um, Got some information from Murray Campbell, one of the co-creators, um, from one of his scientific papers about um, the changes that have been made to the 1997 Deep Blue compared to 1996. Um, of course, you know, 1996, it was a huge struggle to get even something just working <laughs> ready on time. Uh, for the 1997 match, things were a little less hectic and uh, really um, uh, the Deep Blue team was uh, simply building on what had already been made in 1996. And well, considering that uh, yeah, Deep Blue had already beaten Gary in that match, that was a pretty good basis to build on. Um, there was a new chess chip. Um, the evaluation function increased from 6,400 features to 8,000 features. And uh, of course, yeah, you know, when the original chess chip was made, they were scrambling around with a software, desperately trying to implement some features, um, obviously, in the time between uh, the previous match and this match. Um, there was time anyway to uh, to implement more um, more evaluation features. So uh, I think, you know, from a chess point of view, Deep Blue was always going to be a lot stronger. Um, there was um, um, also, um, well, some hardware repetition detection uh, in there and also some uh, specialised move generator modes. I'm reading from the paper there that, um, for example, generate all moves that uh, attack an opponent's piece. It just meant that a lot of useful stuff um, was, um, was just being generated in hardware rather than in software. Um, and in general, um, the uh, effectivity of the chess chips uh, increased to about two or two and a half million positions per second. And um, there were also double the number of chips in the system. And it was also the latest generation of, uh, uh, of computer, you know, to, to provide the, the processing power that was required with, uh, with, so much, uh, with so much firepower. So, yeah, you know, I mean, um, uh, just from a general hardware point of view, 1997 uh, Deep Blue was uh, considerably superior to 1996. Um, and they said that um, the maximum number of moves per second uh, that, they, um, that they searched during the match was 330 million, which is, uh, you know, pretty impressive. So, um, but that wasn't the, the only thing. Um, uh, another key thing was that, um, um, actually as Feng Chung Shu describes in his book, Behind Deep Blue, they really felt that they needed to up their game in terms of, um, yeah, match canniness, match preparation. And uh, part of that was making some software tools um, to help with tuning the evaluation. So, yeah, automated evaluation tuning, um, something, uh, yeah, very, very important uh, when you've got so many features. And also for visualization. And um, I think the idea of those tools was really to help um, uh, Joel Benjamin, um, yeah, uh, analyze together with, uh, with um, a version of Deep Blue and, um, and, you know, work out 
um, some things to teach it and some opening lines to, to recommend to it. Without those visualization tools, very, very hard to, um, uh, to make, to do any, uh, any sort of consistent work. So that was um, um, what the Deep Blue team was busy with. Um, um, yeah, Murray Campbell said that basically um, they really felt that um, they were working the most on Deep Blue's evaluation um, rather than its uh, parallel search or anything like that. Obviously, they upped the hardware, they upped the speed, but um, um, the, the sort of the, the software that was managing all that was basically untouched. Um, yeah, reading uh, Gary's uh, explanations uh, before the match, you know, um, in his uh, recent uh, 2017 book, Deep Thinking, is quite fascinating. Um, he says, uh, having beaten Deep Blue convincingly in the last two games, I made the typical and dangerous mistake of crediting my own play more than the poor play of my opponent. Interesting uh, uh, psychological thing. He uh, draws a parallel with... Uh, um, the, the, the World Championship matches of Bob Vinick. You know, Bob Vinick was always losing the first match and then winning the um, uh, winning the um, uh, the return match. And um, yeah, his opponents uh, Smyslov and then Tal, uh, yeah, didn't somehow manage to cope with the uh, the idea of having won the pre you know the previous match. So he sort of you know attributes some sort of error in thinking to himself. Um, I mean, to be honest, reading the book, I, I get the feeling that um, um, you know Gary had very much the idea, I think, in his head that um, he was sort of doing the chessy stuff, and Deep Blue, the Deep Blue team, was doing the sciencey stuff. Um, so they were approaching it in terms, you know, from a computer point of view, and he was approaching it from the chess point of view. And um, I think that seeing Deep Blue with quite a large chess team. Obviously, Joel Benjamin was there. But there were also some uh, some other American grandmasters who were hanging around, and also uh, uh, Miguel Iescas as well, uh, the Spanish grandmaster. He suddenly sort of felt that, um, yeah, it feels like he felt they were on his territory somehow. Um, and that was a little bit worrying because, um, uh, of course, you know, Deep Blue was going to be calculating uh, better and further than uh, than Gary could. But um, obviously, you know, what, what we didn't really want was that um, it was also going to improve on the chess side. And, uh, well, with such a large team, maybe Deep, uh, Deep Blue's openings would be excellent. And maybe it would have learned a lot about chess as well. So um, I, I really think that that you know, had a huge effect on him. Um, and uh, um, really, yeah, really made him very nervous and very, um, uh, yeah, very uptight about the uh, about the whole match. Um, what he said was, uh, I decided I'd try and use the first few games to see if I could get a sense of its strength and tendencies. This meant playing more passively than I preferred, although it did fit my general strategy of wanting to play quiet positions where Deep, Deep Blue's tactical abilities would not be the deciding factor. So, um, yeah, that explains the first opening. And um, quite interestingly, the first... Uh, game was um, an interesting success for uh, for Gary. Um, quite amazing, in fact. But it also gave a, a very good pointer of uh, some factors of Deep Blue's play that would become very important in the um, in the uh, uh, in the rest of the match. So let's have a look at it then. Mm -hmm. 